It is amazing. I'm serious. You know, it, I know, you know, this may be a little bit too much inside baseball for some people, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, as a pastor and we're in the midst of a, of the dog days of the book of revelation. And, and by that, I mean, just like the dog days of summer, where it just seems like everything's kind of, you know, hot and stagnant and, you just have to kind of live through some things and you have to keep going on through some things. When you get in books like the book of Revelation that are 22 chapters long, they, all of the chapters are filled with things that we're really not familiar with, and yet the Lord wants to reveal them to us so that we can know because it's important for us to know. You know, you, you get to point, a point, everybody starts off and they're thrilled and excited and then at the end, it's kind of exciting because you come to the climactic conclusions of some things and everybody uh, sees how it works and usually the best is at the end. But right in that, in that, in that nasty middle part, that nasty <laughs> now and now part, you can get you know, to feel that, well, maybe I, maybe I don't need to really do this anymore because, you know, I mean, good night. We've been on it for 20 weeks and we've got 12 weeks left or whatever. And you kind of begin to stagger yourself and say, well, I, you know, I hate to drag them on through and all that. But it's, and, and what I'm saying to you is just as I kind of feel that way, I mean, humanity and, you know, and if you see people that are normally here, they're not here. You say, well, I guess they're not here because they're not interested or other things like that, and you begin to think, Lord, you know, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all this dog day stuff, that's really interesting, and, and, and people that love the Bible and love the Word want to know these things, it, you, you, you want, you're saying to yourself, Lord, we need, a wit we need a witness for you. I mean, we, you know, salvation and your spiritual life and what God will do and and the things you pray for and how God will lead you and speak to you and your position and relationship with him. Lord, we need a challenge about that, you know? And lo and behold, the Lord just has ways of doing that, doesn't he? I mean, seriously, with Jamie coming forward, what a great word. I'm serious. I've never heard an evangelist say anything better than that. I, I guarantee you about how God chases you and God relentlessly follows you and God does things and, and takes those terrible things that happen and uses them to walk through doors in your life and strengthen you. And, and then you come to church and they have songs about how that's the love of God and he's not going to let you go and he's not going to quit working in your life and some of that stuff that you think is horrible and terrible. The Spirit of God takes even those terrible things and, and, and uses them to bring your life to another level. God's love is reckless, it, and that's really a great description of his love. Imagine leaving 99 and going after one, not knowing whether the 99, when you get back, will be eaten up by a lion or something. That's what God does. God said he left the 99 and he went to find the one little sheep that was lost. I mean, this is reckless. This is, how do you, you know, what other word would you call it other than, man, God, you're just reckless with this. Yeah, and he's amazing too. Because <laughs> when he finds us, he's not ashamed of us. Now, we can be ashamed of ourselves and we are ashamed of ourselves many times because we feel so unworthy but God says, you are worthy because I created you, and you love me because I first loved you. And we love God not because we, we ran after God and found God and wanted God. We love God because God pursued us, and the love of God found us. We didn't find it. If God couldn't run faster than us, none of us would be saved because most of us were running away from God as fast as our little feet could take us running right off the cliff of disaster. And just in the nick of time, the grace of God reached out, snatched us away from that cliff, saved our souls, set us on another path to heaven. And here we are, loving God, wanting God, studying the word of God, trying to have a different life. And his spirit is on the inside of us, pushing us forward. We don't always do right, but the spirit inside of us pushes us to do right. The Spirit of God inside of us convicts us to do right. The Spirit of God leads us to do right. It leads us to understand things and to see things. Tell your neighbor, truth is not discovered. Just look at him and say, you don't discover truth. You do not discover truth. Tell him this, truth 
is revealed. I'm just saying to you that you do not discover truth. When God has you prepared, he then reveals truth to you. Jamie's a perfect example. I mean, I know many of you really do not know Jamie, and, and, and I don't know her super, super personally, but I've seen a lot of things in her life and because of association with her, with, you know, with her, with her, with her parents and so forth. And, and I can just tell you that, that at many times it was like conversations and counselings and prayers and just like all the stuff that people do in your life, you know, that love you. They've talked to you. They've spoken to you. They've tried to tell you how to be. They've tried to relieve stress off of you. They've tried to get you in therapy or whatever it might have been, but you weren't prepared. You weren't ready for that. And so nothing really happened except them trying to comfort you. But then all of a sudden, one day, Somebody said something or some commercial said something or you heard something read or somebody's kid said or, you know, you went to church and a song was being sung and boom, the truth of God just spoke to you and just zoned right in on you. Why? Because God was ready to reveal truth to you. And when he gets ready to reveal truth to you, brother, it's coming. It's coming to your heart and, it, and it's going to change your life. He's going to, I mean, your life will never be the same. I'm not saying you, won't, you still won't mess up or run away. I'm just saying you won't be ever able, be able to do it again and not know what's going on, all right? That's just all I'm saying. And you, yeah, you'll never be the same. It's like Billy has said to me many times. He said, you know, now that I'm a Christian, I've been a Christian long, many years. He said, I can do anything I want to do. And I said, you know, you're exactly right. I can do anything I want to do. I could go to the bars, I could chase the women, I could, uh, you know, try to have a life of gambling. I mean, I could just name it. I can do all of that that I want to do. But the difference is when I came to Jesus, he changed my wanter. That's right, that's right. And I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's like, hey, you can do it if you want to. Well, God, I don't want to. Because those desires are no longer in my heart because the blood of Christ has washed me around and trained me and taught me. And a lot of the things like we're talking about in the book of Revelation, they may seem like, well, so what? But I guarantee you things like this begin to build a base in your life where the Word of God has, has a hold of you and it'll attach itself to you. Because God cares that you know what goes on in the future. He says, this will bless you. In the first chapter, he said, you're blessed if you read this. You're blessed if you understand this. You're blessed if you'll practice what this book says to you. And then at the end, it says, you're blessed if you read this. <laughs> you're blessed if you know this. You're blessed if you'll act out life according to this. It's the only book in the Bible, and I believe the entire Bible is blessed by God, and I believe every book um, in the Bible is a blessing from God. But this is the only one that begins with a blessing from the Spirit of God and ends with a blessing from the Spirit of God. And so in these dog days that we're in, and we're going to be in for the next four or five chapters, guys, I mean, these are dog days, and I'm, by that I mean, look, we're going to be seeing things that are going to happen near the middle of the tribulation and then toward the end of it. And, and I mean, they may, be, they may be many years from now. Uh, I mean, should heaven hold back and the grace and mercy of God hold back? They, they might be many years from now. They might begin uh, uh, tomorrow, today, <laughs> this afternoon, because we don't know. But at some point in the future, the things that I'm about to show you and the things that God shows us in this ninth chapter are going to happen on this earth. And what you can see right now is I'll guarantee you, and I'm going to try to help point this out, you can see the alliances, you can see the players moving into position, you can see it on our news every day as you hear reports every day of this incident happening in Syria. Israel shoots down on Syrian plane and Russia starts getting mad about it because they, you know, whatever. And then you see tension on the border of Iran and Syria. And you see, you know, Saudi Arabia saying some stuff and Pakistan gets involved. And now Turkey wants to act like a horse is behind. And we've been, you know, they've been our ally for a dozen years. We got major military air bases in Turkey 
They've been, they've been a part of NATO, part of our friends, and now they're acting as bizarre and weird as some of these other Islamic nations and Russia, all of them just seeming to act in concert with each other. What's going on with this place? What's going to happen to Iran? Are we going to blow it up or is it going to be you know, wiped off the face of the earth? What happens with Lebanon and Syria and, and Ethiopia and the, some of the upper parts of Africa that's going to be involved? Libya's got its mouth wide open now. I mean, they're just all cackling and all uh, tension and stress going on in all of that area. Why is that? Well, we have a little indication here by a gigantic civil war, not a civil war, but a gigantic world war that happens during the tribulation period. During the tribulation period, there is a war fight on the, fought on this earth that makes all other wars that have ever been fought on this earth look like a, a Sunday school picnic. This world comes together to fight against a tiny, tiny, tiny little dot on the map in order to annihilate it, and in order to, in, in, to enslave its people, in order to take its reserves and take its spoil. Everybody say oil. <laughs> to take its spoil. Have you come to take a spoil? He says, have you come to take a prey? Those are the people. You're going to take them slaves? You're going to steal their oil? And Oh, it's a mighty, mighty world war. And and it's a, it's, a, it's a tremendous battle, and you need to see it. And that's what these fifth and sixth trumpets are. And I'm going to try to show you something. i got a little tiny clip for you that I'll show in a few minutes and, and just try to give you an idea of, what, of how I think this thing might look when the fifth seal is broken of God. Now, let me just put this up here. Let me, let me see if I can get, get, me, um, get my little deal working up here. Yeah, let's see if we can get it. So far, we'll have a little stagnation. All right, here we go. This is starting with uh, verse 1, chapter 9. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth nor any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like, like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. This is the fifth seal, and the fifth seal releases destroyer demons on this earth. I told you that the seals under the, under the, the fifth trumpet, under the seals, what happens, and I'll make this quick, but just when the seals are broken, the first thing, there are seven of them, you remember, and the, the, the white horse comes forth, and the red horse comes forth, and the black horse comes forth, and the pale for, horse comes forth, and these are just releasing spirits on this earth that are already here, that are already, I mean, people are being rebellious, people are being lawless, people are re raising anarchy. Look at the world we're living in. Have you ever seen a world that's more lawless than the world we live in now? where every imagination of law is being challenged. And I'm not just talking in the United States. I'm talking around the world. 
Countries are being invaded. Laws are being disobeyed. Uh, violence is everywhere. Police have sections of this world and sections of cities and, and so forth they won't even go into because it's so dangerous for them to go into. Police officers are being shot. Yesterday uh, on, the, on the news, or was it Friday, to Brookhaven Police, Brookhaven, Mississippi, small town USA, two officers shot dead. Uh, uh, I mean, come on, lawlessness, anarchy, violence, just perpetrating itself all around the world. Well, as these seals are broken, you ain't seen nothing yet because anarchy and lawlessness and rebellion and all the pent-up desires of hateful men and hostilities will just be released and, and those horses and seals just release those things. And then uh, the fifth seal, you see martyrs under the altar crying out, praying out, how long before you avenge our blood, O Lord? And then in, in, the, in the sixth seal, uh, the, uh, the, the earth, the, the big men, the king, the wise men, the rich men, the sl- rich men, the rich men, the slaves, and everybody runs to the mountain and says, Mountain, fall on me and kill me and save me from the face of God and the wrath of the Lamb. And then, and then you have that seventh seal when it's broken. And when the seventh seal is broken, it opens up some trumpets and the first trumpet sounds. And you remember what happens. The earth begins to be attacked. Crazy stuff ha- starts happening on earth. So in the seals, you have that old violent, wicked nature of man is just released onto this earth without any restraint. Then when we start the trumpet sounding, the earth gets blasted. The earth itself begins to be bound and dominated. First trumpet, what happened? Fire and hail came out of heaven, mingled with blood and hit people on the earth and what? Killed a third of the people there. And then a uh, the second trumpet sounds and this giant meteor falls into the saltwater ocean, kills a third of the marine life that's there. It, that part of the ocean becomes blood. It didn't say it was like blood. It said it became blood. Just like the river did when Moses tapped it and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And then the third breaks in this comet. It said like a lamp burning. It came out and it hit the land. And a third part of the fresh water was polluted with a, with, 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 with a product called wormwood, which means bitter. It's so bitter tasting stuff. And, and it kills a lot more people. And then the fourth one was a fourth trumpet blew, and a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars went dark. And now the fifth trumpet blows, and the fifth trumpet, according to what it said here is, let me just go back and I'll go through each verse with you. Yeah, let's see if we can get back up there. Yeah, I'm trying. This technology is grand. All right, here we go. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star falling from heaven to earth. By the way, we want to know who the star is. The star is Satan. The star, you remember Jesus, you remember, and, and, and I, maybe you don't, but let me just quickly get it to you. Isaiah 14, if you want to read it when you get home. In Isaiah 14, you have the war that started in heaven when Lucifer, one of God's angels that led praise in heaven, decided he wanted to be God. And he said, I'll exalt myself above the stars of God. I'll be greater than God. Everybody will worship me. And God said, ah, you're out of here. And boom, kicked him out of heaven and he fell to earth. And we know this happened because that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, and I saw Satan like lightning fall to the earth. So this fallen star, most likely, I mean, you know, when you get to heaven one day, if Jesus said it ain't him, don't be surprised. But the only, the only, the only reference I have to that is Jesus said he felt like lightning from heaven. He got kicked out when he disobeyed God. So it's not unusual for, to, for us to see him now falling down to the earth again. And when he hits the earth, he's been given some keys. Now, he doesn't have these keys. He is given these keys. Because you remember, Jesus said, I have the keys to death and hell. And so Jesus gives him the keys to open up what is called the bottomless pit. And so when he hits this earth, he opens the abyss, the bottomless pit. You say, what is the bottomless pit? And I don't have to go down, time to go into super detail, but let me just say this, that there is a pit in which demons who are so vile and so wicked that they won't obey the boundaries that God has set up between demonic activities and men. 
You say, what would that be like? Well, it would be like back in the book of Genesis where it said the, the daughters of devils mixed with the sons of God. And they created this giant race of people. And, they, and, and these people were bizarre and wild. The book of Jude talks about what God did with these angels. The book of 2 Peter tells us that they were chained and bound in darkness in a pit. The demoniac of Gadara, when Jesus, when he was coming toward Jesus and he saw Jesus, what did all the demons in that demoniac of Gadara say? He, they said, Jesus, thou son of God, have mercy on us and don't send us to that horrible place. What were they talking about? They knew about that place where radical demons that couldn't obey the difference where God said, you can do that, but you can't go past that. You can do this, but don't touch that. And they couldn't obey that, and God just snatched them, threw them into a bottomless pit, and shut the door on them. Yeah. Now, in the fifth trumpet, God boots Satan, who the Bible tells us in Revelation, stands before God day and night, accusing you in the presence of God. I've told you this before, and I'm not trying to start some bogus theology but I've told you this before, that Satan is a created being, right? Which means he was an angel. He used to be an angel. God created angels. The only uncreated being in the entire cosmos is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are, create, they are, they are eternal, which means they had no beginning and they have no end. Everything else has been created by God, including the devil. Every created being cannot be omnipresent, which means they cannot be two places at one time. They can only be one place at one time, just like you. Now, they're blazing fast, and there are plenty of them, and they're highly organized, and they, can, they have networks that can get information. I mean, every time you open your mouth and tell them how to harm you, uh, they get a report to the headquarters, you know. Uh, and boy, if I see her today, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> Walk right around the block. Boom, there she is. I mean, heavenly days. Why did that happen? Well, you told him what would ruin your day. So he made sure that happened. I mean, they're highly organized. They report to the headquarters, but they can't be everywhere at, t at one time. So you tell me, like Flip Wilson said one day, the devil made me do it. Well, no, he didn't. Because, Flip, you've never seen the devil. As a matter of fact, you've never seen the devil. The devil has not ever talked to you or led you or tempted you. His demon army most likely have, and I'm sure they have. And evil uh, within the nature we're born leads us to want bad things and do bad things and follow bad things. But the devil is in heaven accusing you in the presence of God right now. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. You, can, you gave your life for that? What are they doing? Oh, God, I know you're happy. Look at that, boy. They just, woo-hoo, that, that blesses you, doesn't it? Yeah, look at, they don't deserve heaven. They don't deserve you. You died for that. Look at that worthless piece of junk that won't even claim you, denies you. Look at their mouth just running, cursing, and walking away from you. That's something you died for. That, that's what the devil is doing right now in heaven and God's on his throne, and the only hope you have is that the great defense attorney, the Lord Jesus Christ, is standing there and said, yes, God, but my blood covers their sin. My love catches them. My love overwhelms them. My blood has washed them clean. God, we can't kill them. They've committed themselves to him, they, to me. They followed it. They're going to change. We're going to work in their life. It's going to be great. And the devil's saying, no, they're not. They're demons. And, and, and so finally, when the fifth trumpet sounds, God takes a little fuzzy-headed demon, boom, kicks him out of heaven. He falls like a star falling and hitting the earth. And Jesus has given him some keys. Hey, when you get down there, open up that pit. And it's time for those vile, wicked demons that are worse, the worst of the worst. It's time to let them out on the earth. And when he gets to heaven, he unlocks that thing and smoke boils up out so big it just blocks the sun out. And then out of that giant smoke come these, these demon locusts that 
look like, uh, that, are, that are big like horses and chariots and they have iron on them. They have some kind of shields that protect them and they, got, and, and they sound like a bunch of horses running everywhere. And he opened the bottom of this pit and smoke rose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Scorpions, you know, obviously, has anybody, anyone in here been stung by a scorpion before? Kyle, you probably have. Yeah, <laughs> I knew you. Yeah. Well, scorpion, scorpion stings don't usually kill you, but they are very, very painful. Is it a neurotoxin that they shoot out? Is that what it is? Yeah. It's a neurotoxin. In other words, it, it starts affecting the nerves of your body. And it, and it most likely won't kill you, but it is torturous and tormenting and it's terrible. And, and so these, these demon locusts now have tails, it says, that look like scorpions. And, 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 and with those tails, they can do stuff to hurt people that last five months. A uh, curious time because, by the way, five months is the general lifespan of a locust. I don't know if you know this, but I graduated from Mississippi State, so let me tell you. Let me tell you that locusts live from May to September, generally. Five months is their lifespan. Don't know if it has anything to do with this five months, but five has something to do. Five's the number for grace, so maybe, it's, uh, maybe it could have been 25, you know, and five is simply an act of grace. And they were not given authority to kill them. In other words, these demons can't kill people, to the, but they torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it, and they'll desire to die, and death will flee from them. Now, you might remember in the sixth seal, men were trying to call down the mountains on them and all of those kind of things. And in the fourth trumpet, they didn't want to die, but they were killed. Now, when the fifth trumpet sounds, these people are going to be, are going to be attacked by these demon locusts, and it, they're going to do something to them that's so painful and so horrible that these people are going to want to die, but death flees from them. They can't get away. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. I mean, John said, only thing I can tell you is, I mean, it looked like a horse with all his shields and all these covers over their face. And I mean, it was just, I mean, I, I, I saw, they, it looked like these, these, these horses that are prepared for battle. It was big. I mean, think of 2,000 years ago, somebody trying to decide, describe some, what might happen with weaponry in, the, in, in 2018 or 2020 or whatever. And on their heads were crowns, he said, of something like gold. So he, he didn't say they had crowns of gold. He said it looked gold. It was kind of shiny. It, it, it looked like gold. And the faces were like faces of men. I mean, these, these locusts, these demon locusts look like, boy, they're, they're, they're intelligent. You know, they're, they're, they're uh, uh, rational. They have a plan. They have a strategy. These are not just wild bugs flying around like locusts do. Like Solomon said, I don't know if you know this, but, but Solomon said in Proverbs that the locusts have no king, if you've ever read that. Well, this bunch has a king. It has a leader that's calling the shots. And it says they had hair like women's hair. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 says that the glory of woman is her hair. When they danced in the Old Testament, when they danced around the, 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 the king or the man they were trying to please, women would take their hair and they would twirl it like this. It would be a dance and the hair would be twirling like this. And so John said, man, these demon locusts, Looked like they had something twirling. They looked like they, I mean, it was all I can, I don't know what it was, but it, it looked like hair to me. I mean, it was, it, you know, it just looked like something twirling around the top of their head. And, uh, and, they, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. So these things are ferocious. They're voracious. Have you ever thought about taking something away from a lion once he's chomped down on it? Forget it. And they had breastplate like the breastplates of iron, like the breastplates of iron. Back then, soldiers had iron breastplates. Now we have titanium. Now we have, uh, we have uh, polycarbonate shields. Uh, what else do we do? We, we, have, uh, uh, we have all kind of uh, multifaceted materials, Kevlar-type material. We have uh, all of these different metals that make these shields for all of our modern weapons that we go... And John said, and it looked like they had kind of like iron and the sound of their wings. They, these things had wings 
and it was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. When these locusts got stirred up, man, it sounded like a regiment of horses and chariots running down the road. It was like unbelievable, and they had tails like scorpions. So their, their tail is prominent. It sticks up in the back like a scorpion. That is the prominent feature of it. So they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. So whatever they did to harm mankind for five months came out of their tail. Their power was to hurt men for five months. And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. Is this Satan? Negatory. Satan is the one who opened the pit. The ones that flew out were in the pit. The king in the pit was this one here, and they had a king in the pit, probably the worst of the worst of the worst demon of all was their king, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, which means destroyer. And his name in Greek was Apollyon, which means destroyer. <laughs> and the reason his name was written in Hebrew and Greek is because they wanted everybody. The Gentiles are going to be tortured by him, and the Jews are going to be tortured by him. Want to know? If you're a Greek, you know, and you speak Greek, just so you'll know his name, destroyer. If you're a Hebrew and you only speak Hebrew, well, let's put it in, you know, let's put it in Hebrew, uh, uh, Abaddon. How about that? Destroyer and destroyer are going to be, are going to be challenging you. One woe is past. This is where the woes start. You remember the angel flying and he said, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. This is where it really gets bad. This is most likely the beginning of great tribulation. I know some of you Bible students, just to make it short, there are seven years of tribulation. The first three and a half years is um, preparation, uh, is uh, deception, is the Antichrist trying to convince Israel that he's their best friend and he loves them and he's going to give them everything and they're going to trust him and all of this kind of stuff. And 144,000 Jews are preaching the gospel and people are getting saved and coming to the Lord, but they're being killed because of their faith and their... And, and, and then right in the middle, after the first three and a half years, everybody say 1,260 days. 1,260 days, Daniel talked about it, you know, had he divided it. He said, all right, we have a first half, and then we have a great tribulation, which is greatest trouble ever hit the earth, never compared to it. Well, it, this is most likely when it starts as these trumpets are being sound, these woe trumpets, and these demons are being loosed on earth. One woe has passed, but still two more, two more woes are coming after this. And so God releases on this earth this demonic army. Now let me just show you a rendition of what I think. I've got a little tiny video that I put together for you to kind of give you an idea of what, I, what I'm talking about. Now as it shows, I'm just going to read these verses that I just read. And, and, and you, just, you just watch and, and, and see how this thing goes. All right, let's see if we can get this thing playing. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like the breastplate of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men for five months. 
And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek it has the name Apollyon. One woe is past, still two more woes are coming after these things. I believe this is a, a look at what John was actually seeing as he was watching what happened at the sounding of the fifth trumpet. This activity, by the way, is going to be what releases the next angel, the sixth angel, which starts World War III. I mean, there have been lots of wars on this earth. I mean, nowadays, we don't have war like we used to. We used to have countries against countries. We used to have uh, declared enemies. They had their soldiers. They had their uniforms. They had their army. They had their armament. And they, they, it was nation against nation. It was country against country. It was groups of country against groups of country. We no longer have battles like that today. Today, we have a bunch of people going around trying to blow themselves up and blow everybody else up and sneaking around trying to kill people and shoot people and poison gas them and whatever else might come to pass. But according to the book of Revelation, there will be a war fought during the tribulation period that will be the worst war that has ever been fought on this earth. And I'm going to, you know, I really want to get this. I don't want to drag it out to next week, huh? No? I'm looking at Tanya. She's my instructor. Are you guys okay with this? I mean, I'm not going to preach long. I, I mean, I'm coming on through because I think you guys understand war, right? I just want to sh show you who's involved and how it happens because these players are very much alive today and they are very much interacting with each other today as I speak to you. Here's the passage. Then the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. This altar is the same one that those souls were under crying out, how long are you going to let this go and not avenge our blood? So this is the voice of God. This is either Jesus Christ or God speaking. And he speaks this voice and he says to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. The river Euphrates and the basin of the river Euphrates has always been the center of, of, of power in, in scriptural worlds. Babylon was there. Uh, the Medo-Persian was there with Darius the Great. The Greek Empire with uh, Alexander the Great. And, in the, and, the, and the Romans were there with the Caesars. So evidently, there is a demonic force that God has put in that area. And this demonic force... And the Bible talks about these things like in the book of Daniel where the prince of the power of the air kept Daniel's prayers from being answered for 21 days. So it's not unusual for demonic activity and I know you can't see it so you might think it's not there. Just like that bunch, I guarantee you, if we went back to the dark ages and we tried to tell them that the plagues that were, the bubonic plague was not caused by fresh air, which is what they believed, they believed the bubonic plague was caused by fresh air, so they started burning fires and shooting guns and trying to take all the fresh air out of a room. And if we had walked in there and we had said to them, hey, that plague's not being caused by fresh air. That plague's being caused by a little flea that's on those rats, and it's a bacteria, and if you'd kill those things, everybody would get well, and they would just laugh because they would know we don't know what we're talking about. And there are wise people nowadays and smart Alex and ridiculous people that laugh at demonic things, who take it easily, who don't really believe, ah, oh, that's a bunch of superstitious hog. I'm telling you, God says there are demons that are set in charge of things, and all of a sudden, four angels that are under the Euphrates River are released and given power. So the four angels who had been prepared, who had been prepared for that hour, in other words, God knew it beforehand. God prepared them, and there, and He said, "All right, I have a time in the future, and I'm going to let you go." And, and and for the hour, the day, the month, and the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. Whoo! All right, in the fifth trumpet, they tried to kill themselves, and they couldn't. Now in the sixth trumpet. A third of the earth is going to die. I don't know if you're aware of it by now. Did I leave that part in the note that said, by now, half the population of the world has been killed? Did I put that, leave that in your notes? Uh, when, the, when, the, when the rapture happens, there's seven billion people on this earth. Let's just be generous and say a billion go to heaven with Jesus. That means six billion left on this earth. By the time we get to right here, half... The earth started with 7 billion before the rapture. We're down to 3 billion. 
when this happens right here. A third of them are killed. A fourth of them are killed. You got martyrs under the altar. These people that have given their life to Christ that are, that are sacrificed. I, I mean, we're down to half of the population of the earth. Now, the number of the army of horsemen was 200 million. John said, I heard the number of them it, it, because he, he, he got tired of counting, I'm sure. I mean, it's like, you know, counting 200 million. He said, uh, somebody said 200 million. I, that's good enough for me. Uh, would it surprise you to know that if you took the population of Libya, which is 75 million, you took the population of Iran, 75 million, you took the population of Ethiopia, which is 35 million, and the population of Lib I think it's Libya. Did I say Libya? W one other country, and I'll put it up on the screen in a minute. It's 6 million. Uh, 75 million, 75 million, 35 million, and 6 million. That's, uh, what, 201 million. Just to show you, you know, the figures there. And so John said, man, there was 200 million of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouth came fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. <laughs> you know, I mean, shooting fire like serpents having heads. And with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood which, are, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries by the word, way that word sorcery. Sorceries is the word pharmakias, from which we get our word pharmacy, which means he's talking about drugs. These people in the last days are going to be killing people. They're going to be on drugs. And their sexually, sexual deviation and immorality are their thefts, which looks tame compared to those other descriptions up there. The sixth trumpet is world war. And I'm going to just show you this because I, 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 want to, I want to describe for you, and I promise, I mean, I'm, I'm wearing you out, I know, but hang with me just about like five minutes, I promise you, I'm moving. Is there, does the Bible describe anywhere a war like this? Well, it, yes, it does. In Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39, there is a war that is described on this earth where tiny little Israel is attacked. Now, I want to show it to you because... Me, if you've been in church and anybody's ever preached on this, most likely they've, they've really tried to make this war in Ezekiel be the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon happens at the end of tribulation where Jesus comes back and basically annihilates Satan and all those that try to kill Israel with a word out of his mouth. But this battle that Ezekiel talks about is in the Holy Land. It is against Israel. It does involve a two million man army. And it has lots of similarities, but it's not the battle of Armageddon. And I'll show you in just a second. Let me read the scripture. This is out of Ezekiel 38. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog. Now, Gog is a person. I don't know who that person is. He's the leader of some country in, in, a, in a confederacy of, of, of countries around Israel. Could be uh, the prime minister of Russia could be the uh, royal priest of Turkey. I mean, it could be, it's going to be somebody in that northern confederacy that's going to be the leader of all these armies. So God says, set your face against him of the land of, and I, I, what I did in your Bible, if you've ever read it, it uses words like Cush, Push, Persia, uh, Torgomer, uh, you know, all, all these kind of words. And all I did is put the right words in there for what countries they are right now. Because all those countries still exist, they're just named a different name. And if you look at an old Bible map and you look at a new map, you'll see these names correspond just exactly. I, I didn't, I'm not trying to trick you or make a point. I just want you to know where he's talking about today. Set your face against Gog of the land of northern Europe. Northern Europe is basically... Uh, Turkey and, and Germany and parts of the Ukraine and, and, uh, and parts of uh, Ru even parts of Russia and it goes up, you know, Spain and all. I mean, right, that little central part right there in, 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 the, in the northern part, right above the Middle East, all of that little section up there, the prince of Russia, 
Moscow and Tbilisi. Moscow is a city in Russia, and Tbilisi is a city in Russia. Moscow is the political capital. Tbilisi has been the uh, industrial capital. I don't know if it still is anymore, but, but those two cities are mentioned, so we're thinking the army's probably led by Russia, most likely, and prophesy against them. So he said, all right, turn your head and prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Russia, Moscow, and Tbilisk. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all of your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So God said, you're going to, you know, you're going to be meandering around. You're going to be saying, I need to attack. I need to attack. They was the, those demon Jews, I'm telling you, they are the plague of the world. It is a scourge on the earth. We're going to kid them. They're, they're, they're in our way. Why do we, why is they not destroyed already? That, that, you know, that Antichrist doesn't know what he's doing. That fat cat sitting on that throne. He doesn't, and, the, and, and God's going to just, God's going to like cast a, a, a hook and he's, he's going to catch them and, 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 and just pull them down to Israel. The Spirit of God is just going to pull them to Israel so God can do with them what he wants to do with them, which is not going to be nice, by the way. Syria, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them. All of them with shield and helmet, Germany and all its troops, and the house of Turkey from the north quarters and all its troops. Many people will be with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be on guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those who were brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had, been, had long been desolate, and they were brought out of the nations. And now all of them dwell safely, and you will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. And that whole chapter and the next chapter just go telling you who's going to protest. Western countries are going to protest. The United States is going to protest. Great Britain is going to protest. Australia is going to protest. Canada is going to protest. Western allies are going to protest this invasion. They're not going to fight. They're just going to talk. Everybody say diplomacy. Why, don't do that. That's not nice. That's not sweet. Play fair now. This is not right. You remember, you're not supposed to do this. Yeah, nah, 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 nah. Just weak. <laughs> but they are at least going to protest this thing because Israel still has some allies in these days. But Russia's coming down, and God's going to wipe them off of the face of the earth. Turkey, Libya, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Pakistan, Libya, Ethiopia, Sudan. Boom. You see them now. They, all that bunch over there hates Israel. Right now, they'd, they'd attack Israel in a Mississippi minute if they could get away with it. But they can't right now. Now, I drew put this map up here because I, wanna, I want you to see, and I'm going to try to get this thing, okay, Okay, I, I'm, I got me a little deal up here that I've been trying to use, but I'm just going to, I can't get it to expand and do my stuff, but I, I think you can see everything. I put the little red arrow, arrow to point to Israel. The reason I put the little red arrow is because you couldn't see it if the arrow didn't point to it. That tiny little speck on there, that little, that little speck with that little uh, squiggly thing, that squiggly thing is the Dead Sea. That's tiny little Israel right about at the point of that red arrow. Now, look at the nations that have been described. There's Libya, there's Egypt, there's Sudan, there's Ethiopia. All of them down here going up. Then look over here. You got Syria, Iran, Iraq, and Pakistan, and most likely Saudi Arabia, and they're coming from this way. And then up top, you have Turkey, and you have the Ukraine, which is Russia right up there, uh, and they're going to be coming down from the top. And then you, have, then you have Libya right here on the side and some of these upper Afri uh, African nations, and they're going to become... In other words, do you get the picture? Boom, 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 boom. Coming against tiny Israel to destroy them. World War III, right here, six trumpet sounds. You're seeing them line up today. You're seeing them... Who, who dabbles with all of these countries over there more than anybody else? That's stinking Russia. Putin and his horde are just undermining everything they possibly can. They're selling weapons to these people. 
They're doing business with these people. They're establishing relationships with these wackos that are going to come against Israel, and there's no doubt about that. And you heard this past week, Israel knocked down one of those Syrian jets and said, you send something else back over here, we'll blow it out of the air too. Man, they're not afraid because the power of God is there. Just remember this. God made a covenant and said, I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. Look, God's, God's de- Israel's dealings are with God. They are his covenant people, no matter what we think about it. And he's not going to let them off the hook. They're not going to be saved any other way than you and I are saved. They're going to come by grace through faith to Jesus Christ, recognizing that he is the king. And that's how they're going to get saved. But this battle that happens when the sixth trumpet sounds is a world battle that is astronomical. Now, let me show you. I put these on here because I, I just, I'll read through them quickly. Ezekiel's war is different from the battle of Armageddon. And I know you're worn out, but hang on with me. Uh, Ezekiel's war, northern invasion preceded by the rebirth of the nation of Israel. The battle of Armageddon, the Antichrist tears up his treaty obligations with Israel. So they're not even started by the same reason. Northern invasion involves certain other nations. The invasion is protested by the West. Armageddon involves all nations. When they come against Israel at Armageddon, everybody's coming. United States, Canada, Australia, uh, all of them. Nobody's going to be protesting. Uh, Ezekiel, the northern invasion comes from the utter po- po- part, uttermost parts of the north. The invasion in, in the Battle of Armageddon uh, comes from the other side of the Euphrates, head by the kings of the east. Everybody say China. Uh, northern invasion falls apart as the alliance members turn on each other. Uh, the Battle of Armageddon is ended by the personal return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He crashes the party. Um, uh, Ezekiel's battle was prompted by four demons released at the Euphrates River. The Battle of Armageddon is prompted by three demons sent by the Antichrist, the dragon, and the false prophet. You'll know all about that. Six, six Israel still has Western allies in the war in Ezekiel that, that want to preserve Israel. Uh, in the Battle of Armageddon, Israel is alone, and Jerusalem is actually attacked. By the way, Russia and the Northern Alliance never even makes it to Jerusalem. So, but in the Battle of Armageddon, it's Jerusalem that's being attacked. Israel is safe in the land. They have a peace alliance with the Antichrist in Ezekiel's war. In the Battle of Armageddon, great tribulation is underway and Israel's running for its life. While the, while the, the, the beast, the Antichrist, is trying to kill them a thousand times worse than Hitler would be. Number eight, in the end, Israel is left with a seven-year supply of weapons, and it takes Israel seven months to bury the dead people in Ezekiel's battle. And in the the battle of Armageddon, the dead are consumed by vultures. In Ezekiel's battle, the fall of the northern invaders shocked all the nations. I mean, when Russia falls, Turkey falls, Libya falls, Iran falls, Iraq falls, Syria falls, when they all fall and lose this war, it's going to shake the world up. It's going to just... It's going to be an unbelievable shakeup of world power and world order and all of that stuff. Uh, and the Battle of Armageddon is followed by the judgment of the nation. <laughs> in the battle, in Ezekiel's battles, the nations are going to get upset. At, at, at Armageddon, the nations are going to get judged. Number 10, a number of factors lead to defeat. Western nations protest, confusion of invaders, earthquakes, nuclear bombs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in the Battle of Armageddon, Armageddon ends with one single event, the return of Jesus Christ and his heavenly host, followed by the judgment of Satan and his demons. So that's the difference between the two wars. I just want you to know they're not the same. Two different ones. God's going to do it. By the way, I think the war that starts in the world war, that's in the sixth trumpet starts when that nuclear bomb falls on probably one of the cities, maybe even the capital city of Turkey. Um, it's, there's going to be, that, when, that, when that angel falls, when that demon falls from heaven and hits the earth and, that, and all that, that's going to be like an attack. And it's going to shake them all up, and they're going to start preparing for war. We've been attacked. We've been assaulted. we got to go. There's the hook. You know, too much pride. Too much, too much evil. they got to go. they got to defend themselves. And all I'm saying is God's given you a chance to, to know this. I don't know why he wants you to know this. We, we'll watch it from the stadium of heaven, you know, and say, hey, yeah, I'll sit by you up there. I'm going to sit by you. I'll be doing my hair be doing my hair like this, and I'll, I'll get it back, and I'll say, you know, that's what I told y'all, right? 
And you'll say, you're the greatest, Pastor. <laughs> Stand to your feet, would you?